Good afternoon and welcome to all of you to our second annual Consumer Products Conference. Um, we ran this conference last year, had a great feedback, and we hope to keep you similarly engaged and informed this year. Just to let you know, the session today has been recorded, so a link to it will be available afterwards, and also we're being live streamed on YouTube. So I'm Wendy Hederman. I'm a partner in the commercial technology team in Mason, Hayes and Karen. I'm joined today by my colleagues Dermot McGarr, uh, also a partner in the commercial technology practice. You see Dermot there on screen. Um, we also have Ashling Murrah, a senior associate in our uh, products and uh, liability team, and Jamie Gallagher and Sadi Siki, partner and associate from the product and liability team. And last but not least, in fact, to be speaking first, is our keynote speaker, Juan Bueso, a senior consumer protection manager for the Competition and Consumer Protection Commission in Ireland. Um, before, we're absolutely delighted to have Juan with us. Before I turn to Juan, I'm going to briefly outline to you um, the running order um, for today. Uh, we will have a keynote address from Juan uh, starting in uh, two minutes on consumer protection law enforcement and EU cooperation mechanisms. That will be followed by the second session for myself and Dermot on EU consumer protection law changes. And then Ashling on product safety and particularly the EU's proposal for a general product safety regulation. And uh, the last session will be from uh, Sadi and Jamie on AI, artificial intelligence, and the EU regulation and the impact on consumer products. We will have time for questions at the end. We're allowing uh, 15 minutes or more. And so please do ask questions in the Q&A function as we go along and we'd be happy to uh, answer those at the end. And, and uh, Juan has also agreed to be available right through to the end. So we will have all our questions from all sessions at the end. So now to our keynote address. Um, we're really delighted and honored today to be able to introduce to you Juan Bueso from the CCPC. Uh, Juan is a Spanish qualified lawyer. He's based in Ireland since 2004 and he's head of the Platform to Business Unit of the CCPC, that's the Irish Competition and Consumer Protection Commission. Juan is part of the senior management team of the CCPC Consumer Protection Division and has worked over the past two years in the CPC unit, which is responsible for consumer protection cooperation at EU level. Before joining the CCPC, Juan worked at the European Consumer Centre and the European Commission. So he's eminently qualified to speak to us today about our first topic, consumer protection law enforcement and EU cooperation mechanisms. Over to you, Juan. Thank you very much, Wendy. And, um, well, and, and thank you for the invitation to join this excellent panel and to touch on consumer protection and what law enforcement and EU cooperation mechanisms. So by, by way of introduction, and uh, I would like to first refer to the overall role of the Competition and Consumer Protection Commission, the CCPC, which, as you know, uh, is Ireland's statutory body responsible for promoting competition and um, well, uh, compliance with and, 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 and uh, enforcing where necessary um, consumer protection law as well. So this includes over 40 legislative instruments instruments, much of which, most of which are monitored and enforced by the CCPC Consumer Protection Division. So one of the areas of activity of this division, uh, the Consumer Protection Division, is Consumer Protection Cooperation, or CPC, uh, as, as we call it, which is basically the, you know, the cooperation between the national authorities responsible for the enforcement of consumer protection law and the uh, European Commission. So having said this and moving on to the next slide, I'm going to provide you with, uh, you know, over the next 10 minutes or so, uh, an overview of the current framework uh, for cooperation and enforcement of consumer protection in Europe. So I'm going to first refer to the legal instruments underpinning this work. I will then provide you with uh, more details about the structure 
of the CPC network and its activities and you know, having regard to the action um, undertaken over the past two years. And to conclude, I will give some examples uh, in the context of online platforms and, and refer to market trends identified by the CPC network. So uh, moving to the next slide. Um, I suppose uh, we have uh, three main legislative uh, milestones regarding the consumer protection cooperation or CPC uh, legal framework. So on the one hand, uh, the, the first framework for cross-border cooperation came to effect in 2006, but it only laid, I think it's fair to say that it only laid the foundations of the, um, you know, for, for what is now a more comprehensive, um, um, you know, architecture for cooperation. And so, I mean, back then, key, key co concepts like, like the, you know, one single liaison office per member state and the designation of competent, uh, competent authorities responsible for the enforcement of certain legislation. That was set out back then, but now we have a new, um, more comprehensive um, regulation in 2017. Um, this new regulation uh, came into operation in, in January 2020, and it expands significantly its scope. So there, there is a, a, an annex uh, you know, to this regulation, uh, basically ex expanding the scope to 28 directives and uh, regulations. And what well, th there would be new procedures for coordinated actions. The old regime was based on mutual cooperation, more like a, on a bilateral basis. Now the new regulation is a, is a multilateral um, um, architecture, I suppose, in, in, to facilitate these coordinated actions. Uh, you know, we still have the, the, the mutual assistance mechanisms, uh, but also coordinated actions. And well, the uh, IDIS uh, regulations given further effect to this uh, CPC regulation is the SI 14 uh, of 2020, uh, where the CCPC is designated as the uh, single liaison office for Ireland, um, and also the competent authority for uh, what 16 out of the all the uh, directives and regulations. And there are other, you know, eight other competent authorities in, in the state for the purposes of the CPC regulation. So if we move to the next slide, um, I can show you, I suppose, more graphically the the way the um, this um, cooperation is structured. So you have one single liaison office uh, per member state, um, and and then you know all the all the other competent authorities in, in, in the member state concerned. But basically, the sum of the competent authorities and the European Commission would be the CPC network. And the, the way the competent authorities cooperate with one another uh, in this network is through the single liaison office. So the CCPC will be the recipient of you know, requests or alerts, communications in general, notifications from the European Commission, from the other member, uh, from the other competent authorities, uh, whether in Ireland or in other Europe. And when the CCPC is the competent authority also. Um, well, it would be as with the matter directly, and if if the matter concerns another competent authority in say in Ireland, you know, it could be the the Commission for Asian Regulation or the Central Bank, the Data Protection Commission, etc. Uh, we will then you know pass on the information. I mean, this is all done through a, a, the Internal Market Information System or the IMI uh, system. But uh, again, it's just a, a matter of coordinating the work. Uh, between the various competent authorities and the European Commission. So that's the, the role of the CCPC as both single liaison office and competent authority. So moving on to the next slide. Maybe. Um, just to see what are the main activities of the CPC network. So as, as I mentioned earlier, um, we have mutual assistance or bilateral um, requests. And this would be either requests for information or requests for enforcement. You can find the, you know, the precise uh, 
scope of, of, of these uh, exchanges in, in Article 11 and Article 12 of the CPC regulation, respectively. And that's something that we could find in the in the old regulation. But now we also have these um, union-wide or multilateral mechanisms that includes coordinated actions. And that's where a number of, um, well, you know, there, there could be a, um, a trade there that operates in a number of uh, member states. So consumers in a number of member states may be concerned by the practices of, uh, of a trader, whether based in one of those member states or in other member states within the union or even outside. The, so you, instead of addressing those concerns uh, on a bilateral basis, um, the, the new uh, coordinated action mechanism uh, provides for um, um, a mechanism for cooperation and, and, and you know, to, to facilitate the exchange of information and, and enforcement. Equally, we have alerts where any member state, any competent authority in a member state can alert the rest of the network of a given practice. And these alerts may or may not uh, lead to a coordinated action. We also have um, external alerts, and this is also a new a provision in, in the new CPC regulation where certain designated bodies by the member states that do not have enforcement powers may nevertheless uh, issue an alert. And uh, in, in Ireland, the European Consumer Center is actually the designated for that purpose. And uh, yeah, in, in other Europe, uh, that's a common occurrence, but they may also be consumer associations and, and even you know multinational uh, organizations like Beuk, the the consumer uh, you know the I suppose the federation of consumer associations in, in Europe. And under the external mechanism, external alert mechanism, the competent authorities are not required to act, um, but obviously uh, that may inform their decisions. Um, notifications. Uh, could be used to inform uh, other competent authorities of measures that have been adopted at national level. So you're not necessarily alerting them of a suspected infringement or request, requesting information or, or requesting enforcement, but you, know, you, you might simply use the, that mechanism to you know, just, just make them aware of, of an action that you've taken at national level. Um, sweeps is something that we had before. And, and we continue to use extensively. And that would be a monitoring activity of a given sector, or, um, or it could also be um, you know, a, a particular provision of, you know, it could be the Consumer Rights Act, for instance, or other commercial practices. You know, it could be either based on, on a given provision of the, you know, the, the consumer protection laws, or a, a given sector, for instance, car rental or, or the airline industry. Um, and so normally this uh, um, monitoring activity would be conducted at the same time using the same methodology on a given day or on a given week, on a, on a given uh, period of time. And the results of a sweep may subsequently lead to other enforcement activities uh, or engagement with a trader if the findings suggest that there might be a, an area where a non-compliance is detected. There are other activities that I'm not going to uh, expand here uh, in the interest of time, but you know, would be related to capacity building and international cooperation with, with third countries. So moving to the next slide, I have some data of the actions undertaken by the CPC network in the last couple of years. And um, this information has been recently published by the European Commission. Uh, this is an actual uh, legal requirement uh, in, in the CPC regulation itself, in, in, in its Article 37.2. So thanks to the, um, uh, that provision, we have this report uh, published by the European Commission, where you can see that uh, over the last couple of years, uh, there were 312 mutual assistance requests. Uh, of which uh, 231 were enforcement requests and 81 information requests. Just uh, for context, I suppose, uh, 
I suppose uh, we could say that uh, two of the information requests would concern Ireland during this period, and nine uh, enforcement requests would concern Ireland. And in, in relation to the alerts, uh, there are 89 at network level, and 23 of them resulted in a coordinated action. Um, we did respond in Ireland to 22 of the alerts. You know, and, and the others were not, it was not necessary to provide any uh, feedback or input. Uh, and as, as regards the coordinated actions, uh, we gave uh, feedback in, in most of them, uh, uh, 15 out of the 23. And in two of them were actually, uh, they're still ongoing, but uh, we have uh, taken an active role, you know, co-leading the, the actual coordinated action. There have also been 36 external alerts, which as I mentioned before, there is no uh, obligation to you know, take action as a result of, of the external alert, but might lead to a, an internal deliberation and, and, and inform uh, other actions. Um, you know, in the context of perhaps other internal alerts or, or you know, the deliberation that might follow. So for those who are interested in, in, in finding more details, the, I, I provide a link here to the, this uh, biennial uh, overview. And, and then just to give you maybe more specific examples other than just numbers, maybe we, we can move to the next slide. And well, this would be in the context of online platforms, uh, where you know, in the last couple of years and in the context of COVID, uh, you know, there was, there was plenty of uh, desk research, and uh, I suppose the um, you know the digital markets provide a uh, you know good conditions for for carrying out that type of uh, activity, and this. I mean, uh, the, the overview provides more examples, obviously, including the traders' concern, etc. But just to give you an indication of the areas that we've been monitoring, um, and, and they could go from um, well, the authenticity of uh, the reviews, you know, uh, could be like fake reviews as opposed to um, genuine ones, um, or well, the, the, how genuine certain offers are or are you know, if a trader is engaged in unfair commercial practices or, you know, the, the search results. Um, that's uh, something that, especially in the context of um, the Omnibus Directive, it will, uh, uh, I suppose, require more scrutiny in, in, in the near future. Um, there's been um, intense monitoring activity of uh, terms and conditions to ensure that information is clear and unfair. Of course, the um, the cooling of period, the, the the right of you know the right to cancel uh, should always be uh, guaranteed, and, and information should be clear, and you know, all the requirements uh, complied with. Um, the very identity of traders, you know, to make sure that they are not uh, disguised, and you know, there's also uh, I suppose the, the issue of influencer marketing is, is also um, an area that has attracting more and more interest. And then, well, of course, you know, the, the, the full price uh, being displayed and, and, and if there are any discounts, et cetera. That's also an aspect that uh, we will have a, an interest in. And, and again, I mentioned the Omnibus Directive that will inform for sure uh, future activity. And well, moving to the last uh, slide, I believe is the, yeah. The, uh, and, you know, just, just thinking of market trends, that's been in consultation with the members of the um, CPC network. And this is broadly aligned with the so-called like, new consumer agenda. And but you can see that there would be like four main sectors that uh, have been um, featuring um, over the past two years and, and some will continue to, to, to feature, of course. So we have the digital markets. I just mentioned the, you know, some of the items that would have been checked uh, during this period. And I'm not going to repeat the, the topics, but you know, I see there like uh, dark patterns. Uh, that's an, an area of, of um, that is attracting more and more interest, of course. Um, 
this is something that again I, I took from the European Commission's uh, biennial overview. Um, so other than the digital markets, we have the green economy, and uh, there's been a sweep on, um, well, I suppose, uh, misleading sustainability, uh, sustainability claims or, or greenwashing. And so um, that's uh, an example of how a sweep may help us uh, gather information that can subsequently be used uh, to assess compliance and engage with a, a trader to correct uh, or, or to address uh, you know, any concerns that might be identified or, or consider you know, enforcement action. Um, at, uh, at, inter at an international level, uh, I suppose it's, it's also important to acknowledge that e-commerce uh, you know, is, is a global uh, occurrence. It's not just about uh, platforms or, 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 or traders based in the EU. They, they may also operate from other jurisdictions outside the EU. And, and so that requires um, um, cooperation with other agencies as well. And but I mentioned here, obviously it happened in the last couple of years, the, the pandemic happened. So uh, some of the sweeps and, and the activities also concerned um, practices uh, in, in related to COVID-19, you know, from scams and you know, there was a sweep on that as well. But there's been also the issue of um, cancellations of, you know, flights and, and holidays and accommodation, et cetera. So there's been, um, you know, it's been intense activity as well in, in, in that space. Um, the, you know, online travel agents and, and airlines canceling their flights, not offering refunds, but vouchers, et cetera. So that, that's also been an area that uh, requires the, well, it led to coordinated actions indeed. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. And again, uh, I would refer to the European Commission's overview. You have the link there. And if, you know, I would be very happy to um, answer any questions you might have to, towards the end. Um, my last slide uh, has the contact details of the CPC unit in the CCPC. So if you want to get in touch, uh, we will be very, very happy to, to deal with your query as well. So back to you, Wendy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Juan. Uh, that was fascinating to hear on the uh, enforcement and cooperation mechanisms, and particularly because one of the changes that Dermot and I are going to outline in more detail under the Omnibus Directive it relies heavily on that cooperation regulation that you've been speaking about, the uh, 2017 2394, um, in relation to enforcement action. Uh, it sort of flows from that uh, cooperation regulation. So, Juan, thank you very much for that. We will move now to the uh, second session, um, which is an overview of the consumer protection law changes uh, in 2022. For this session, Darren and I will give you as much detailed insights as we can on some of these key changes. Um, we're going to talk principally about the Omnibus Directive, or talk first about the Omnibus Directive, then move on. To, so on the next slide, you'll see then we're going to talk about the Digital Content Directive and the Re Revised Sale of Goods Directive. And we will, at the end, touch on how these directives will be implemented in Irish law via the very recently published, just hot off the presses last Friday, the draft consumer rights bill. Um, we are leaving time at the end uh, for questions. Um, so hopefully you'll uh, uh, find some of what Darren and I have to say of interest. Um, and we've also got slides obviously in which we've set out some of the broader points um, and we will circulate these uh, these after the session. Um, there is quite a lot of legislation which we're going to talk about so what we're not proposing to do I suppose is go through uh, the chapter and verse of each, um, each directive or um, the Irish bill rather what we want to do is focus on the practical application um, and the issues and challenges which can arise. Um, so with that in mind, Wendy's going to start with an overview of the, uh, the Omnibus uh, Directive. Sure, okay, thank you, Dermot. Yeah, the Omnibus Directive, or as it's also known, the 
Better Enforcement and Modernization Directive. Now, this is part of the EU's uh, new consumer deal, which was published by the EU Commission in 2018. Uh, you know, effectively, consumer protection law in the EU has been around for quite a long time. The Unfair Contract Terms uh, Directive dates back from 1993. And in fact, the EU uh, has some of the strongest consumer protection rules anywhere in the world. But when the European Commission did a review in 2016, 2017, and this was partly prompted by weaknesses shown up from the Dieselgate scandal, uh, and the difficulties that consumers were having in getting redress in that instance. Um, the EU Commission found that European consumer protection law was wanting in several respects. Uh, it hadn't kept up to date with a lot of online practices. There were gaps and confusions between goods and software and apps and digital elements. Um, and also it needed uh, more consistent enforcement because really enforcement was either patchy or non-existent across the member states. So the Omnibus Directive or Better Enforcement and Modernization as it's known, it's a short directive, just uh, nine articles. Um, it does what it says in the tin as in it addresses enforcement and modernization. As regards the modernization part, that is adding provisions into and beefing up the four directives that are there on screen, the Unfair Contract Terms Directive, Price Indications Directive, the Unfair Commercial Practices Directive, and the Consumer Rights Directive. And effectively added in things that are now practices or terms or issues that need to be addressed, given the way that such a percentage of people trade and, and purchase online. We look at some of the specific provisions of those four uh, updates in a moment. I'm going to hand you to Dermot to run us through the enforcement side of the Omnibus Directive first. Thanks, Wendy. Um, yeah, so in relation to enforcement, I suppose the big headline and the point which um, uh, perhaps garnered most attention when the directive was first published is the ability of regulators at a national level to impose turnover-based fines, which I suppose are similar to those which you find in the GDPR. Um, these are limited to, to, I suppose, widespread breaches. Um, and for these types of breaches, there can be fines of not less than 4% of the trader's annual turnover in the member state or member states uh, which are concerned. And then if there isn't information um, uh, uh, which is available on the annual turnover, then there can be a two million fine or at least a two million fine. Um, I'm saying at least here because the Omnibus Directive sets the minimum requirement, I suppose, and then it's up to member states uh, what they decide to, um, to apply in their country. So the fine can be higher than 4%, I suppose. Um, equally, it's important to remember that the offences um, need to occur on a widespread basis. So that means that they will occur in more than one member state. So the fine which could be applied is the aggregate of the relevant percentage across the member states uh, which are concerned. I think this point about the widespread infringements is very important. Um, in the legislation, there are three types of widespread. Um, uh, infringement. The lowest threshold is on intra-union um, infringement is what it's referred to as. And this is where there is harm caused uh, to the interests of consumers on a collective basis in, a, in one member state, which is different to the member state in which the trader is established or where the offence is committed. So I suppose what you can tell from that is what what they're aiming at with the fines here are, I suppose, more material, widespread breaches or issues. Um, turning briefly to the Irish legislation, so the draft consumer rights bill, um, the approach it takes is that it applies the 4% uh, slash 2 million actually, to, um, not as the minimum, to, to, uh, but as the maximum fine which can be applied uh, to one of these widespread breaches. So Ireland, um, unlike 
certain other countries, um, uh, France and Italy, for example, um, is not opting for either higher fines or for applying these um, uh, turnover-based fines to Irish-only um, uh, infringements or breaches. Um, and actually Ireland is sticking to a, a 60,000 euro limit for the Irish only um, breaches. Um, finally then on enforcement, the bill provides um, certain criteria which the court, and in an Irish context, it will be the court, it will be uh, uh, the regulator, the CCPC, when they're imposing a fine, they're, they're provided with this non-exhaustive list of uh, criteria to consider, uh, which I've included on the slide there. Um, you'll see that these are all sort of things you'd broadly expect. Um, I suppose the point to note is that they're actually very, very similar to the criteria which are included in the GDPR. Um, so I suppose what to make of all this? Well, I think the widespread requirement is a very significant hurdle. I would, I would not expect in practice to, for there to be large numbers of these turnover fines. Um, and we heard from Juan there that in the last two years, there's been 23 actions um, brought, which while I'm sure very significant, isn't a very high number. Um, having said that though, the, even with the widespread uh, qualifier, this is still a very significant uh, development in Irish consumer law. So in particular, when you consider the context that when we started in 1995 um, uh, with the Unfair Contract Terms Act, the maximum fine uh, was 1,500 pounds. So it's quite a big um, move in that period of time. Uh, it's important to note as well that these fines, so the larger end of the fines, um, are without prejudice to the penalties which can be imposed under the Irish Act. So there are still lesser fines for offences and your terms can still be unenforceable. So there's still all those kinds of, um, I suppose, issues and remedies. Um, and then this national variance issue is also important to note if you're an international business, um, because although, as we've noted, Ireland has gone for the minimum, that's not the case in uh, several of the member states, um, and some in fact have gone um, as high as 10% um, for the turnover fines. So I'm now going to hand back to Wendy, who's going to have a look at some of the challenging issues um, uh, with the, the, um, uh, the directive. Thanks, uh, Derek. Yeah, so the Omnibus Directive, it makes uh, substantive changes, updates across the four directives, which relate to sort of various stages of the online sales activity from the consumers first searching online, you know, to purchase goods right through the sales process and the sales contract. I'm not going to be able to cover all of the issues and we have plenty of articles and things we've published before, give you a comprehensive overview. Instead, just to focus on a, on a, a few highlights. So it's... Uh, a point that you should all remember before we dig into this is that the consumer protection laws now uh, will apply to uh, free services, free apps, social media, etc., where the consumer effectively pays with giving its personal data. So where the trader collects personal data from the consumer over and above what is needed simply for providing that service, well, then that's considered to be the consumer having given consideration and the provisions of consumer protection laws, particularly um, unfair contract terms, unfair commercial practices, and the digital uh, service directive we're going to get to will apply. Transparency is a big theme um, in the unfair commercial practices and the consumer rights or distant sales directive. W one of the requirements, new requirements, is that a uh, marketplace uh, must disclose to the consumer the sort of parameters for when, uh, when search results are ranked. Um, and so how is the ranking done? You know, it's clearly really important for consumers as to uh, the search results that come, you know, the top three search results are probably going to result in 60 to 70% of the um, purchases that are made. So that's what um, market research shows that uh, consumers are highly likely to click on the first two or three results. So basically the platform, and this is where it's got uh, tricky for some of our clients, is 
to provide that information on what the uh, search result ranking parameters are, they must be displayed in a specific section of the online interface that is directly and easily accessible from the search results page. So that requires a little bit of kind of re-engineering of, of interfaces um, as an important element of the, the transparency. Also on transparency, there's the issue of hidden advertising. And in the biennial report that Juan pointed us to on his slides, which just was published there this month, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was surprised to see that um, hidden advertising is the top uh, unfair commercial practice that traders, uh, sorry, consumers across Europe uh, have come across. Um, it is uh, prohibited. Uh, the unfair commercial practice directive says that you uh, prohibits it showing any search results unless you clearly disclose paid advertisements within those search results. Uh, next one there I have is price personalization. Uh, as yet, if there isn't a prohibition on price personalization. It is again a transparency issue that the consumer be informed if price personalization is happening. Um, that means effectively consumer profiling or uh, assessing the consumer's purchasing power before the trader offers it a price. Doesn't prevent traders using dynamic or real time pricing based on um, market demands, but uh, if you do other consumer profiling, um, that must be disclosed. Uh, the price indications directive, the one change to that is about showing the previous lowest price um, when a trader is running a price reduction or promotion. So if they say 20% off, well, then they must uh, uh, indicate what the previous price was that they are claiming a 20% discount off. And that price must have been uh, offered for at least 30 days. Now, you think the wording that this is a relatively simple article. In fact, when you start getting into a trader having had, you know, three for two offers or a 10% discount across the whole store, it might get tricky to identify and, and, and qualify or comply with this requirement of the prior price in the previous 30 days. Um, I think, Dermot, uh, over to you on one or two interesting issues. Yeah, so a few of the other issues um, which arise are can cause problems in practice, I suppose. Um, one of the most prominent is there are now stricter rules on the posting of uh, user reviews, both in terms of uh, restricting companies from posting their own reviews and also requiring them to take steps to deal with false reviews. So a trader who provides um, a consumer reviews for its products must provide information about whether and how they have verified uh, that the review in question is actually genuine. Um, they must take reasonable and proportionate steps to check that the reviews from consumers who are claiming that they have actually bought or used the product, again, are genuine. Um, the directive talks about um, using a technical means to achieve this. I think what that will mean in practice may well depend on the nature of the product, but equally will depend on the tactical means uh, which are available to the trader. Um, I think one practical point which we can safely assume this will lead to is if you put hurdles in front of people to leave reviews, they're probably less likely to do it. So there may be less reviews um, and equally those who do uh, those who do leave reviews may be the ones who are more motivated um, and usually the ones who are, who are more motivated are uh, displeased um, uh, perhaps with the product in question. So linked to this then is that um, it's also an offence to uh, manipulate uh, reviews or endorsements. So this would include only submitting uh, positive reviews or actually putting your positive reviews at the top. Um, fake reviews, I suppose, are actually quite a topical issue at the minute. So Juan actually mentioned there um, that it's been an issue which has come up in practice with them. We're seeing in the UK that they have announced that um, uh, the Competition and Market Authority is now going to have the power to police fake reviews. Um, it's been reported that they're going to have the party issue fines of up to 10% of global uh, turnover. 
Um, in, in the US, they already have laws around fake reviews. Um, and actually, in uh, January um, of this year, the Federal Trade Commission announced a 4.2 million settlement with the clothing provider uh, Fashion Nova over charges that it blocked hundreds of thousands of poor customer reviews over a four year period. Um, so I expect, or I expect this is more, we are this issue of fake reviews and how you manage your reviews is something which is gonna become a more prominent issue um, in particular when the new legislation comes into force. Um, one final point for me on this um, is my personal favorite and it's a prohibition on uh, ticket bots. So it's now going to be prohibited for traders to sell tickets, which were essentially, or sorry, resell tickets, uh, which were essentially bought uh, using ticket bots. So hopefully that might impact the pain, which um, a lot of people go through when they try and buy tickets to an event and they're immediately sold out. Um, but I suppose we'll wait and see on that one. And Darrell, I'll do that last one, because the Omnibus Directive really makes the most extensive changes to the Consumer Rights Directive regarding distant sales. I mean, that's something traders had to get their heads around, you know, with cancellation period in 14 days and uh, managed contract information just in the past uh, 10 years. And the, the changes to the uh, distant sales provisions some of them are technical, some of them will require traders to change some of their processes. There's more extensive uh, mandatory pre-contract information, particularly like, for example, as regards if personalized pricing is being used or uh, references to the types of direct uh, forms of communication that can be used with the trader. Uh, there's been a change or amending of the this obligation on a trader to remind the consumer that they have, uh, that there's an obligation that the goods, services, or the digital content would conform with the contract. Um, there are changes regarding the withdrawals, and, you know, cancellations and updates to that monthly cancellation form. Again, that would need, uh, traders need to work in. Um, the, the amendments are kind of tweaking, except that um, we have found already that uh, clients are finding it difficult to uh, work out how to comply with the extra requirements on digital content, digital services, where the consumer asks for the service or the content to be provided before the end of the cancellation period. So if you wanna download uh, a movie or to watch the boxing match or whatever, and you go to do it online, if you if you want it within the 14 day cancellation period, well, then there has to be this prior express consent. There has to be an acknowledgement by the consumer that they lose their right to cancellation and the trader has to, uh, to communicate back. And in fact, the provisions around the acknowledgement as far as it relates to digital services really is it, quite difficult to work through. So if you're a trader who uh, sells digital services or content online, that's something that I'd strongly recommend you have a look at. And sorry, I don't think Dermot, you and I, uh, yet so we're sort of talking about this in the future. The official enforcement date or effective date for all this is the end of May, 2022, 28th of May, 2022, that all of them we're talking about should come into effect across all EU member states. Uh, but Ireland is a little bit late, or will, is likely to be late in implementing it. And we'll come to that uh, timing in a moment. Um, we will, before we leave consumer rights, uh, the Omnibus Directive, uh, could I have the next slide, the one about marketplaces? Because there are additional, there are new obligations for marketplaces. I've already talked about the transparency that's required when marketplaces are displaying search results. Um, but the, uh, there are additional changes um, about the platform disclosing to the consumer, to the purchaser, whether the traders on their website are trader sellers or consumer sellers. And uh, Sinead, am I asked to flick to the next slide and I'll explain this. So, and it's something that has been an issue for the European Commission and various uh, consumer authorities over the past few years, you know, as to whether the entity that you're planning to rent the, the house from on Airbnb is a business or is it a private uh, seller, if you like, because your rights as a buyer 
are different. So in the left hand side, we have where you've got the platform and the sellers on the platform are traders. Well, then it means that the relationship between the seller and the buyer is a B2C contract and the buyer will be protected in that purchase or rental or whatever by consumer protection law. In the right hand side, where the uh, sellers on the platform are not businesses, where they're non-traders, well, then the sales relationship between the seller and the buyer is a C to C, consumer to consumer. And the reason that the um, uh, directive, the omnibus, requires the platform to firstly identify whether the sellers are traders, and then secondly, to call out to the buyer that if the seller is a consumer, that they won't have uh, the benefit of consumer protection rights. That's all quite you know, onerous. Now, it is on the basis of this self-declaration by the seller as to whether they're a trader or not. But you know, questions do arise if the platform knows that the trader has a VAT number, or if the trader knows that the, sorry, the platform knows that the trader is making 20, 30 grand a month on selling on the platform. Can they still go, oh, well, they say they're, they're a consumer. So those additional uh, obligations in the uh, consumer rights directive regarding marketplaces and platforms is really something um, that we need to. Um, so I should say, but before we move off in relation to the omnibus directive, is that there is updated guidance from the EU Commission from December uh, on each of these four directives as amended by the Omnibus Directive. And that's a useful tool uh, to help get a deeper understanding. And also in our team, we've prepared a markup of the Distance Sales Directive, showing the changes from the 2011 Directive to what the Omnibus Directive requires. And I'm happy to send that to anybody uh, if you need to work through in relation to the new obligations on distance sales. So I think Dermot, can I ask you, what are your main uh, takeaways on the Omnibus Directive? Yeah, so I think on, so it's really on the enforcement side, I think, um, although the directive does have the sort of turnover uh, GDPR style fines, there is a fundamental difference between the fines under the Omnibus Directive as they're implemented in Ireland and the GDPR, I think, both in terms of scope and their application. Um, in practice, I expect it's, it's primarily going to be large um, uh, international traders who are likely to be impacted by the, you know, the higher end of the fines. Most domestic traders are still primarily going to be concerned about offences under the Irish Bill only. Um, that said, though, I think even the prospect of these very material fines for consumer law issues will concentrate minds. I think both in terms of senior management attention and in relation to awareness by consumers. Um, this is certainly what we saw with the GDPR, um, and I would expect to see a similar, if perhaps slightly less pronounced, impact um, uh, by the Omnibus uh, Directive. Um, and Wendy, for you? Yeah, well, um, what I would take away from uh, everything that I've been working on the Omnibus uh, Directive is that I think this more robust consumer protection regime means that businesses really should think about moving away from a sort of bare minimum compliance, uh, which has been with the way the consumer protection law has been considered in, you know, in, in the recent past, and really adopt a, a kind of fully compliant, consumer friendly approach. You know, the smart traders are realizing that not only for risk management, but also improve customer relations. It's a good time to move from like, how little compliance can we get away with to how can we actively improve our transparency in our way dealing with consumers? And when you hear, you know, what Juan was outlining to us, that the consumer protection authorities do take a sort of proactive approach to this, what they call their sweeps, where they go actively out looking at the online practices of traders. They are picking up um, where uh, traders are not complying with unfair commercial practices or un unfair contract terms. So, with the implementation date of the Omnibus Directive being the end of May, and it'll come into effect sometime soon after that in Ireland, really would recommend to traders to do a, a kind of a compliance audit, a check on their online sales processes, um, make sure they don't have, um, you know, that their customer review process is, is thorough. 
uh, and they're complying with the other requirements. Okay, so we move briefly, I think, on to uh, the Digital Content Directive, which is another significant change. It's already in effect back since January 2022. Sorry, it's already past its implementation date. Um, but Dermot, can you tell us what the story is here? Yeah. Thanks, Wendy. Um, yeah, so the Digital Content Directive, I think the first point is an important note of context. So previously, we haven't had European legislation which deals expressly with digital content and digital services. So in practice, what we've had to do is apply, I suppose, laws which were drafted not with those types of sort of modern um, um, services and content in mind, which, to be honest, has been quite challenging at times. So I think this directive is, I suppose, a bit of a game changer in that regard. Um, a few sort of points to note, I guess. The the uh, the content directive applies on the Irish Bill, which will bring it in the Irish or Irish law, applies where the trader supplies um, content or services where, uh, where the consumer pays a price, obviously. Um, uh, but we have this issue, as we've mentioned already, where that price can be personal data. Um, this won't apply where the personal data is only required to uh, perform the service itself or where it's required by the trader to comply with the legal requirements. In both instances, though, um, this carve-out only applies if that is all the personal data is being used for. If it's used for any other purpose, then the carve-out doesn't apply. So I think that in practice will um, uh, probably restrict um, uh, that, that carve-out for most traders. The, the a directive and the Act um, are going to have pretty broad application. Um, and this is because the key concepts of digital content and digital services are broadly defined. So digital content is any data uh, which is produced or supplied in digital form. So that's things like apps, videos, audio files, music files, ebooks. Um, Digital services are equally broadly defined, um, and generally they are anything which involves the uh, creation or processing of data in a digital form. So again, this is things like video and audio sharing, social media, importantly, um, games which are offered by the cloud, um, uh, for example. There are some interesting exclusions, um, which may be relevant to some of our attendees. So. Uh, financial services is excluded. Healthcare generally is excluded, but not healthcare apps. Um, gambling uh, is excluded. Um, uh, cinemas are excluded, but a uh, digital TV isn't, it's included. Um, so I think you can tell from that, it's, it's pretty broad in its application and it's gonna impact a lot of content and services that I think we all use on a fairly a fairly regular basis. If we turn then to issues about liability and redress, um, so I suppose the starting point is if there's a failure to supply, then the trader has to be given a second chance to supply, and then if he fails, uh, the consumer has a right to terminate. So that's fairly straightforward. Um, once you get past the, uh, the initial supply, then it's all about the a conformity of the content or services. So the content or services need to comply with subjective uh, conformity requirements and objective uh, conformity requirements. These cover I'm not sure anybody else can hear Dermot. Is it Dermot's feed that's gone or mine? It's Dermot's feed, Wendy. Okay. Sorry, okay, uh, I better pick up from here and we'll see, can we get uh, Dermot back? He was speaking about the remedies um, and the 
uh, it's subjective and objective conformity that the goods it covers a lot of things that you would sorry the service you'd expect things like fit fit for purpose that they comply with the description given in the contract um one other aspect regarding uh, conformity is that a failure by the uh the trader to supply updates including security updates to keep the services or content in conformity will be deemed a failure uh, by the trader. And the updates, incomplete updates or defective updates will also be considered a lack of conformity. Um, something that's helpful for the trader is that if the customer or the consumer uh, decides not to install the update, well then that's not the trader's problem. Um, that it doesn't amount to a lack of conformity in the legislation. The, Draft bill in Ireland. So the Digital Content Services Directive at an EU level, uh, they talk about one year guarantees and some instances two year guarantee period of conformity. But just to note that in Ireland, because we have a six year limitation period, while the question of conformity of the goods at the time they were delivered or conformity of the goods for the duration of the subscription agreement for the uh, time in which the services were to be provided, um, that may still be you know two years, but consumers have up to six years to uh, seek legal remedy for those lack of uh, conformities. Um, I think we should probably move on to the sale of goods directive, uh, which is, it goes hand in hand with the uh, digital content, digital services directive. This is actually an update of the previous sale of goods directive that was there. It is designed to work alongside the digital content directive and to ensure there's no gap between what is what's protected or uh, under the remedies in uh, the goods directive versus what's in the digital content directive. So goods with digital elements, and that would be things like fitness trackers. So you buy the physical tracker, but you get software on it or um, a smart TV or smart fridge. They will be covered by this revised sale of goods directive. But, uh, and several recitals of both the Digital Content Directive and the Sale of Goods Directive try and uh, clarify that overlap or dividing line between the two directives. Um, but the principles of the Sale of Goods Directive are very similar to, work in a very similar way to what Dermot has described to us under the Digital Content Directive. For example, this thing about subjective criteria, uh, which effectively means that depending on the sales contract, the goods must be of the description, the type, the quantity, the quality, um, as described in the sales contract or as, as uh, held out by the trader. So they must have the functionality, compatibility, interoperability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they're all subjective criteria. And then when you get to objective criteria, the goods must be fit for purpose and of be of a type and of a quality that a consumer is entitled to expect for goods of that kind. So that's a very broad um, obligation in terms of objective criteria. The Sale Goods Directive also talks about durability. And this has been an element of consumer law for quite a while, but there isn't a whole lot of clarity within the directive as to, well, how long must it be durable for? Uh, and clearly that'll be different from something that is, you know, a pen that you've bought at the shop versus a, um, a smart fridge that you might expect to last you five, seven, ten years. So durability is somewhat tricky and unclear uh, factor. Same thing as in the um, digital content directive, this thing about updates. But what traders should note is that the obligation within the goods directive is that the primary obligation to supply updates for goods with digital elements is on the trader. It's not on the you know, Zanussi or Bosch or um, the manufacturer of the fitness tracker. So we are recommending that traders, retailers who sell goods with digital elements have worked out how they or the manufacturer uh, is going to uh, comply with this requirement about providing updates for um, goods with digital content. Uh, there, the consumer has a two year guarantee uh, to remedy any defects in goods which are discovered after delivery. And member states are free to introduce longer liability periods or shorter if it's um, second-hand goods, but at least one year. And we've already mentioned the um, six-year provision in Ireland. Remedies, I'm not really going to go through that, uh, but they are 
once you get into the consumer rights bill, you'll see that they're slightly different than we have currently in our sale of goods legislation. And traders should make sure that in terms of the, that they're aware of how the remedies work and the priority, um, you know, if a consumer wants something to be repaired rather than replaced, or when are they entitled to a price reduction? When are they entitled to actually terminate the contract? They won't be entitled to if it's a minor defect, it has to be a severe defect that the trader has failed to, um, to fix. And uh, my final point there is that the deadline for implementation of this directive, the Senate Goes Directive, and also the Digital Content Directive, was the 1st of January 2022. Now, that deadline hasn't been met in Ireland. And that brings us to uh, what is the story in Ireland? We have now, as of last week, the draft Consumer Rights Bill. And this Consumer Rights Bill was um, announced during last year, June 2021. And we go to the next slide, please. Designed to be or described by the uh, minister, the relevant minister, as most significant overhaul of consumer protection sales law in Ireland for 40 years. And it probably would be that because it is uh, has to implement all of the legislation that Dermot and I have been speaking about uh, and will need to repeal, revoke or amend a lot of existing law. So I'm not gonna go through, there's about 170 sections of the act, or sorry, it's a bill, 170 seconds of the bill, about 165 pages. Um, we did have an outline of a bill last year and so what we've been uh, careful tracking is, well, now what has uh, changed in this uh, draft consumer rights bill? Um, and I'll tell you the main change, but so you can, what I want to do here is just give you an overview of a sort of a guideline to uh, the act so that you can work your way or if you feel inclined to the 170 sections. Part two of it effectively implements the revised set of goods directive I've just been talking about. Part three will implement the digital content uh, services directive. Part four is going to be other services, the non-digital services, which aren't regulated at EU level, but it means we have to change things in our uh, Sale of Goods by Services Act. And then you get down to the next sections being uh, implementing changes to unfair contract terms. There'll be uh, the unfair contract terms regulations, as you know them currently in Ireland, will be repealed in their entirety and replaced with what's in the Consumer Rights Bill. Um, the Consumer Protection Act is going to have extensive amendments there is a part eight there is not required by any of the legislation we've been talking about. It's placement of consumer um, uh, related to consumer hire. And then you have a section part seven on proceedings and penalties. But I suppose a couple of sort of three or four points. I know, do we have Derek back? We do, Randy. Yeah. yeah. We do. OK, um, I'll just note a couple of key things uh, that certainly have struck me in reading this Consumer Rights Bill and then uh, wrap up with yourself. So one of the things to be flagged by the government is that this Consumer Rights Bill brings in a blacklist of unfair consumer terms, basically terms that will always be unfair. The trader won't be able to argue that in particular circumstances that they were fair. Um, that's in a section of the bill, but they're not, it's not actually going to be an offence unless a court makes a declaration that those are unfair and the trader continues to use them. Um, there are sections in each part of parts two, three, four, which will be quite relevant in, in practice for traders because they prohibit the trader from restricting or excluding its own liability for what effectively are the statutory obligations. So a trader is not allowed to uh, exclude its liability if it fails to provide the updates. It's not allowed to exclude its liability if it, or even restrict its liability if it fails to provide services uh, that are conforming with the legislation. Um, so in practice, that's going to be quite important. Um, another thing to note, even though this is described as a major overhaul of legislation, and there's a lot of legislation that is going to be repealed or revoked by this Consumer Rights Bill, it's actually not a complete tidy up because it is going to leave in place the 1893 and 1980 Sale of Goods Act. Yes, I did say 1893, uh, that's 130 years ago. 1893 and 1980 Supply of Goods Act uh, in respect of non-consumer sales. So where a trader is selling B2B, he's still going to have to keep an eye on uh, and uh, work with the 1893 Act and 1980 Act. And finally, one thing that does annoy me in this uh, bill 
is that the turnover based fines, what Dermot outlined to us earlier, this fairly significant development at EU level, uh, allowing the courts to impose turnover based fines uh, or up to 2 million for EU wide or widespread breaches. It's tucked away in the very last uh, part of the very last schedule. And even then, it's not even in the Act itself. It's done by way of an amendment to the SI that Juan was talking about, the SI uh, 14 of 2020. So it's pretty tricky for people to find, they could read this Act from page one to page 165, and they wouldn't see that there is the 4% uh, turnover-based fines for EU-wide breaches. So sorry, rant over. Dermot, can you tell us yeah. the likely timing of this uh, consumer rights bill? Um, yeah, so as we've mentioned, we, we had, so last summer we got the heads of bill. Um, we were, to be honest, we were assuming that we were going to have the draft bill well in advance of today's session when we started planning it. Um, we ended up getting it on Friday. Um, so we all had a very fun weekend. I think the, the issue is that it's, it's very long, it's very complex legislation. I think it's, it's pretty unlikely that it's gonna get passed by the end of the summer session. It may, but it, it seems pretty unlikely. So it may be the autumn um, at the earliest before we have you know the final bill brought into law. I think the point for businesses though, is that as we've mentioned, we are sort of late um, in terms of this, this legislation being brought into force. So I would expect when it is finalised, there'll be a relatively short period between it being um, uh, going through the legislative process and actually becoming effective. So I think that goes back to the point that uh, Wendy mentioned earlier about actually doing the groundwork now um, and doing those types of audits of your consumer facing um, uh, materials to um, so you're in a strong position when it actually does become finalised and then perhaps it's only the final few tweaks of things that did change through the process which can't be addressed. Okay, Jeremy, thank you. Um, that wraps up our first session. Um, we are both available for questions at the end, but right now I uh, want to move on to product safety, which is another area I know of interest to our attendees and which uh, has changes in law uh, that are uh, worth knowing about. So, Ashling, could I hand over to you? Hi, yeah, thanks, Wendy, and to Dermot as well. That was very interesting. Um, if we could just go to the first slide, please. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, after years of discussion, in June last year, the EU published its draft proposal for regulation on general product safety, otherwise known as the GPSR. It's intended to modernise and reform the current framework for the safety of non-food consumer products under the GPSD, which has applied since 2001, so for more than two decades. It's one of the initiatives under the new consumer agenda to empower European consumers in the green and digital transitions and to ensure that European consumer protection law is up to date to meet the challenges of new technology. As the GPSD is now more than 20 years old, in that time, there has been a profound shift in the scope of products available to consumers. In its evaluation of the GPSD, the Commission identified a number of product safety issues that related to new technologies like AI and connected devices and the growth of online shopping, which has made trade increasingly borderless with online marketplaces and international retailers selling products directly to EU consumers. So as part of this quick and whistle stop tour of the GPSR, I propose to look at four of those issues and how the Commission proposes to tackle them under the new draft regulation. The first being risks linked to new technologies and increased connection of consumer products. Secondly, the growth of e-commerce and online marketplaces. Thirdly, the coherence of market surveillance rules. And lastly, product recalls and traceability. So if you could turn to the next slide, please. And we look at that first issue, new technology and connected devices. So the fast pace at which technology is developing and the interconnection of products has created new security and safety challenges. And these raise concerns about whether the GPSD is still fit for purpose, particularly in relation to software and AI powered products. <laughs> 
to address these issues, the GPSR updates and expands a number of key terms under the GPSD. For example, the definition of product has been updated to include interconnected items. However, the term interconnected is not itself defined in the GPSR, and the draft regulation doesn't go into any great detail on the types of new products to which this term will apply. The recitals in the GPSR also make clear that specific cybersecurity risks presented by interconnected devices should be dealt with in separate sector legislation. The definition of product also applies to secondhand, repaired, refurbished and recycled products as part of the move towards a circular economy. The definition of when a product is safe has been expanded to cover its duration of use. This in takes into account how a product can change from when it was initially placed on the market through software out updates, downloads and the evolving functionalities of AI products. For example, a previously safe product could become unsafe because of insufficient security updates or a software update, update could introduce new features that might fundamentally change the product from when it was placed on the market. And to address this, the GPSR proposes the introduction of a new requirement on substantial modifications, where responsibility for the safety of a product will lie with the person that's making that modification. So where a product conforms to European standards or in the absence of those standards to national health and safety requirements, the GPSR offers a presumption of conformity with general safety requirements. This presumption doesn't prevent market surveillance authorities from taking action, however, under the GPSR, where a product is considered dangerous. And where the presumption of conformity doesn't apply, whether a product is safe will be assessed against broader criteria under the GPSR, including new criteria for assessing product safety arising from advances in electrical and electronic products. And those include a product's technical and cyber security features, which might impact its safety its effect on other products where it's reasonably foreseeable that it could be used with those products and the effect that other products might have on it as well equally. And also then the learning, evolving and predictive functionalities that a product might have. So if we could turn to the next slide, please, and we look at the, the next issue, which is uh, e-commerce and online marketplaces. So since the GPSD was enacted over 20 years ago, consumers have been buying more and more items online, including technology products. Current surveillance rules under the GPSD are considered insufficient to meet the challenges of e-commerce and online marketplaces, as these online business models and the modern supply chains um, that they have created just didn't exist when the GPSD came into effect. The ultimate aim of the GPSR is to ensure that all products reaching EU consumers are safe, whether they're bought from online marketplaces or in a bricks and mortar shop, and whether from within the EU or from outside of it. So although a voluntary product safety pledge for online marketplaces was introduced in 2018, um, which provides for a number of voluntary commitments on product safety, its voluntary nature and the voluntary participation by a limited number of online marketplaces, um, albeit some very prominent players in the market, was considered um, not sufficient or effective enough to ensure a level playing field. So to strengthen the protection for consumer shopping online, the GPSR has proposed a number of, of new measures. Firstly, the introduction of a new and broad definition of online marketplace, and this is aligned with the definition under other harmonised legislation, uh, for example, the Consumer Rights Directive. Uh, it's part of the broader aim of the GPSR to interlink with existing consumer protection and product safety legislation. It also introduces product safety rules for online marketplaces, which require that they act with due care in relation to product safety issues and fulfil a range of due diligence obligations in relation to the content that they host. Uh, these obligations can include requiring trade or contact information and product traceability information to be collected and displayed for products listed on the platform, registering in the safety gate portal, establishing a single point of contact for communicating about product safety issues with market surveillance authorities and cooperating with those authorities to ensure effective product recalls or to remove and disable access to illegal content um, that, they, that they are hosting uh, on their platform about a dangerous product. For example, online marketplaces under the GPSR are proposed to have two working days to act on an order from an authority in relation to a dangerous product. And they must also allow authorities access their platform to identify dangerous products. And in doing so, they're required to remove any technical obstacles to allow the extraction of this data. This 
you know, um, broad access by authorities is not without controversy, with critics calling for clarification of its scope, as tools like data scraping could potentially undermine the protection of commercially sensitive information and the personal data of traders and consumers that are held by online marketplaces. If we could go on now to the next slide, please, and we look at the next issue of market surveillance and the coherence of market surveillance rules. So the Commission has long sought reform of market surveillance rules for dangerous products in the EU on the basis that it currently, as it currently stands, is too complex and confusing with rules and obligations for different economic operators found across various pieces of EU law. To address this, the GPSR has proposed to align the market surveillance rules with those under the market surveillance regulation to create a single regime for harmonised products, which are those subject to harmonised EU product safety law, such as toys and PPE. As for the rules for non-harmonised products, um, which are not subject to common EU rules, such as childcare products, jewellery and shoes. In addition, the GPSR proposes a number of other um, and other measures, including number one, the removal of the definition of producer under the GPSD and its replacement by the concept of an economic operator, together with the introduction of definitions for the roles of manufacturer, distributor, authorised representative and importer, which is in alignment with harmonised legislation. The GPSR also proposes to expand the application of responsible person under the market surveillance regulation to all products. And so non-EU manufacturers will be required to appoint a responsible person within the union for compliance purposes. Again, this is designed to tackle market surveillance issues caused by online selling and direct imports from outside the EU. As discussed in the preceding slide, the GPSR introduces market surveillance rules and product safety obligations for online marketplaces and retailers to improve the safety of products sold online. And lastly, the GPSR proposes the establishment of the Consumer Safety Network, which is a European network of national authorities who have competence for product safety. And the aim is to improve co cooperation at EU level for tracing withdrawal and recall of dangerous products. So if we could turn to the next slide, please. And the last issue um, that we're going to look at is product recall and traceability. So recent research by the European Commission reports that consumer knowledge about product recalls is weak and that more than a third of consumers continue using recalled products after becoming aware of a recall notice. So contributing to this problem is that information about product recalls is just often not communicated clearly enough to consumers. The GPSR seeks to tackle this issue in a number of ways, including uh, rebranding and revamping the old RAPEX notification system to safety gate and enhancing its functionality, which amongst other things will allow consumers to review warnings and recall information issued by economic operators. It also proposes that manufacturers must notify relevant competent authorities about an accident caused by its product within two working days from the moment it knows of the accident whereas this obligation uh, fell due immediately under the GPSD. This proposal is subject to a proposed amendment uh, by the European Parliament, which would allow businesses an opportunity to investigate a reported accident and have a period of two days from the moment it knows the outcome of the investigation to notify relevant authorities. And in reality, this seems like a sensible and practical amendment. To encourage a stronger consumer response to recall notices, all product recall notices under the GPSR are proposed to contain standardised and compulsory information, including a clear description of the recalled product, the hazard associated with it, and the actions that consumers should take. To improve overall recall effectiveness, economic operators um, under the GPSR will be proposed to uh, use consumer data at their disposal to directly inform consumers of recalls and safety warnings for products they have purchased. And where not all affected consumers can be contacted directly, economic operators will be obliged to share recall notices as widely as possible, including on their websites, on social media, in retail outlets and other mass media channels. Where there is a diverging assessment by member states about the risk presented by a product, the GPSR introduces a new voluntary arbitration mechanism under which the European Commission can make a decision on the level of risk presented by a product. All right, then we can, if we could go to the last slide, please. And I just have some concluding remarks and anticipated next steps.
So the GPSR forms part of a wider overhaul of the EU product regulatory landscape, including the Commission's proposal to modernise the product liability directive. Again, in light of the same broad general reasons, the move towards a circular economy and to address challenges from new technology and online marketplaces. Its enactment will result in sweeping reform of EU product safety law, resulting in increased and sophisticated safety and compliance obligations for stakeholders across the supply chain. It will also strengthen the enforcement powers of market surveillance authorities, including in relation to penalties. So, for example, member states will be required to introduce penalties for non-compliance that are dissuasive, effective and proportionate. The GPSR requires that the maximum amount of these penalties must be at least 4% of the annual turnover of the economic operator or the online marketplace in the relevant member state where the non-compliance occurred. There's also scope for periodic penalty points to be applied to compel certain actions, including, for example, to compel online marketplaces to allow market surveillance authorities to perform data scraping of online interfaces. In terms of next steps, the GPSR is subject to a lengthy legislative process, which will involve scrutiny and approval by both the European Parliament and the Council. The Parliament is currently considering amendments to the proposal uh, published in December 21 by its Committee on Internal Market and Consumer Protection, and a vote is expected on this in mid-May uh, of this year. The Council is also expected to publish its position on the proposal in the coming months. At national level, the Irish government launched, launched a public consultation on the GPSR, which ran until 24 September 21. To date, the feedback from this consultation hasn't been published, but it's intended that the views that the government received from stakeholders will be summarised by the Commission and presented to the Parliament and Council and help to inform the legislative debate. So final agreement on this text is probably not anticipated until at least later this year. In the meantime, however, we can expect that there will be much and continued debate and proposed amendment to the text of the GPSR. So uh, I suppose as a, as a final takeaway, uh, all stakeholders will be advised to continue to closely monitor the progress of the proposal uh, through the Parliament and the Council, and just to be aware of any um, amendments that may be made to the original text. So I'd like to thank you for your time and for your attention this afternoon. I'll hand you over to Jamie and Sadi, whose presentation is on the regulation of AI and its impact on consumer products. Thanks for that, Ashley. Um, hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to this session on AI and consumer products. So I'm Sadi Siddiqui. I'm an associate in the Life Sciences Regulatory Team here in Mason Hayes and Curran. In this session, what we'll propose, what we'll aim to do is provide some useful insights and to highlight the key issues that are relevant to the proposed regulation of AI and what this means in terms of product safety, product liability, uh, so what we've seen over the past few years is our team, uh, it's seen a steep rise of client products which incorporate AI. And not only that, but also increasingly complex AI. And so this is very much reflective of the fact that AI is becoming increasingly more commonplace in our daily lives, from autonomous cars to predictive typing in our emails. So it seems only right that we should start paying close attention to how policymakers perceive AI and how plans to regulate AI are taking shape at an EU level. Uh, for this, I'm joined by my colleague, Jamie Gallagher, who's a partner in our team. And the plan is for us to have a conversation. Uh, I'll be asking Jamie to shed light on certain aspects of the EU AI regulation and how it interacts with the existing consumer product regulatory framework. But uh, before I do turn to Jamie, uh, I think it's just worth considering the recent legislative developments at the EU level. So Sinead, if we could have the first slide, please. Um, thanks. Uh, so over the past three years, the EU has engaged in a number of different reviews of the fitness for purpose of product legislation. And this would be the light of new technologies, connected devices, Internet of Things. However, AI really started taking a focused review with the publication of the, this was February 2020 white paper report, uh, which set out for the first time a clear idea of where the EU would be heading in terms of regulating AI. Uh, 
uh, there are clear recommendations arising from this, and these all fed into the three European Parliament proposals. Uh, these were published uh, October last year. Uh, and with this momentum continuing, we saw the publication of the draft legislation on 21st April 2021. And since then, the EU Council has published what's called a compromise text with a number of amendments, uh, most notable of which would be the classification rules for high risk AI systems uh, that's been largely rewritten. And then just last month, the EU Parliament issued its opinion on the draft AI regulation with its own amendments. Uh, and these would deal with issues related to innovation, competitiveness, research, sustainability, and future changes. So it's, uh, I think it's, it's fair to say that there's quite a lot, of, quite a lot going on in this space. So uh, I'll turn to Jamie. Jamie, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about the scope of these proposals. Sure, and then thanks, Sad. And we might take the next slide as well, please. Um, in terms of scope, I, th I think one of the features of, of artificial intelligence that's probably always going to be a challenge is that it's, it's a type of technology that is always going to be developing and changing at, at a very fast pace. So when it comes to regulation and policy, and, and I think, you know, as is the case with a lot of digital products and services, you know, getting to agreed definitions and, and setting the scope in terms of what it is exactly uh, it, that's being regulated uh, is particularly hard. And I think AI is, is a particularly good example of that. So with that in mind, um, the definition of an AI system from the original draft proposal uh, was left uh, purposefully broad. And that's with the aim of having it be as, as technology neutral uh, and future proof as possible. So you can see from this slide that the wording of that original draft definition includes reference to things like software, human defined objectives, and uh, various techniques, uh, computing techniques, which are set out as, as machine learning. And um, so we have things like supervised, unsupervised and reinforced learning and, and things like deep learning. And then you have the uh, sort of knowledge uh, and, and logic based approaches so things like expert systems. And then thirdly, you have the statistical approaches, things like search and optimization methods. So by setting out those categories, the, the legislators are clearly drafting to cover the various different fields of, of what we all loosely refer to as, as AI, but which are actually you know, quite a few different fields of, of advanced computing. So you, know, you have the distinction between machine learning and knowledge-based systems being expressly recognized, for example. Um, and in an AI system as defined here, these techniques are used to generate output, such as content, predictions, recommendations, or decisions. And, and one important thing to note here is that, you know, various tweaks and changes have since been suggested to this definition. So <clears throat> just as one example, the, the EU Parliament opinion from March of this year uh, sought to amend the definition to recognize how AI systems can be designed to operate with various levels of autonomy. Um, and, and all those definitions and modifications that have been proposed, they kind of speak to this wider point on scope um, in that, you know, even the question of, of what is an AI system, what is the regulation going to regulate, is not totally settled just yet. Um, however, the idea that the proposed definition would cast the net quite broad uh, does remain present. Um, if we take the next slide, please, um, um, aside from the definition, I think the proposed territorial reach of the regulation is important to note um, in that it would potentially apply to providers of AI systems that are placing those systems on the market in the EU, and that would be irrespective of whether or not they were established in the, the EU or located in the EU or elsewhere. And um, so if you were outside of the EU, but the AI system that you've developed is being used in the EU, the AI regulation could apply. Um, the regulation would also apply to users of AI systems located in the EU. And I'll, I'll, come, to the, I'll come back to the sort of definition or what, what is meant by providers and users of AI systems in a moment. Um, and also then the, the regulation would also apply to um, both providers and users outside of the EU, where the output of the AI system in question um, is being used in the, the union. So that, that's a feature that could give this regulation a very broad territorial approach that goes far beyond 
the physical borders of, of the union. Um, and, and then importantly, from the, the product manufacturer's point of view, um, the council compromise text would also have the, the regulation expressly apply to product manufacturers placing AI systems on the market together with their products and under their own name or trademark. So as well as the definition of a, a high risk uh, AI system, which we're going to look at a little bit later, and um, the connection between products and AI systems and AI system providers and product manufacturers does seem to be quite prominent um, in the minds of policymakers when it comes to this piece of legislation. And, and just briefly on what's meant by providers and users of AI systems, and the provider of the, the AI system is defined as the person who's developed the AI system, who has had it developed for it. Um, whereas the, the term user in the AI regulation, it, it doesn't have the sort of the intuitive meaning of a natural person um, using an AI system. Instead, a user uh, in this legislation is the entity or person uh, under whose authority the AI system is operated. So just as an example, if company A implements a, a chatbot on its website developed by company B, uh, company A is the user and company B is the provider. Um, and the, the visitor to the website who chats with the chatbot would, would not be the user in the way that the term is used in the, the draft AI regulation. Yeah, so, so it seems like the scope is quite far reaching then. And um, I was just reading around and there's, there's a lot of talk around the draft AI regulations adopting what they're calling a risk-based approach. Um, could you talk a little bit about what that entails, Jamie? Yeah, sure. And if we move to the next slide, please. I, I think the, the, the very broad scope of the regulation is tempered a bit by the risk-based approach, um, which has these three tiers. So you first you have these unacceptable risk AI systems, which as the name implies are banned. Um, and those are listed under Article 5 as systems that uh, do things like deploy subliminal techniques that could uh, distort or influence behavior leading to, to physical or psychological harm. You have systems also involved in things like social scoring for individuals. So that's things like um, predicting or calculating uh, trustworthiness over a given period of time. And you also have things like real time uh, biometric identification systems that would be used in publicly accessible spaces for the purposes of law enforcement. Um, although there are, I suppose like everything, certain exceptions and circumstances for the, so for the real time biometric ID systems, it's things like searching for victims of crime like missing children or uh, preventing threats to life or things like terrorist attacks. Um, but, you know, setting aside the unacceptable risk systems, I think the main focus really is the high risk systems. And they're subject to most of the, you know, the extensive technical monitoring and compliance obligations that the regulation would set down. So when we talk about the AI regulation proper and most of its requirements, really that is mainly in the context of these high risk AI systems. And, and those are defined uh, with reference to a list of EU legislation that's contained in the regulation and, and, and Annex 2. And, and that's where we see the start of this potential overlap uh, for products manufacturers. So I want to take a minute just to, just to draw out that question of, of how the AI regulation could impact on consumer products. And I think with that, I think we might take the next slide, please or rather might go back one slide, excuse me. Um, but to be a high risk system, um, you need to fulfill two criteria. Um, firstly, the AI system um, needs to be a product regulated uh, under the various pieces of legislation listed in Annex 2, or it needs to be intended to be used as a safety component of such a product. And a safety component would be defined, or is being defined for the moment at least, as something that fulfills a safety function for the product, uh, where its failure would endanger the, the health and safety of persons or property. And then secondly, this, the kind of second criteria that would also need to be satisfied is that third party conformity assessment would be required under the legislation in Annex 2. So that means that the involvement of a notified body would be necessary in order to place the product on the market. And um, so that leads to the question, what legislation is listed in Annex 2? And importantly for products manufacturers, we have things like the, the Radio Equipment Directive, RED, the Toys Directive, 
uh, the machinery directive, which is which is also under revision as it happens. Um, and we also have legislation covering things like um, recreational watercraft, lifts, pressure equipment, um, appliances burning gaseous fuels, uh, medical devices, and also in vitro diagnostic devices. And, and when we take that list, um, that Annex 2 list in the round, the, the 12 pieces of legislation that are listed there are potentially going to capture a very wide variety of products. Um, and if you have a product that is regulated under those pieces of legislation, you would need to be mindful then of the AI regulation and specifically the requirements of the AI regulation that are applicable to these high risk systems, which are onerous. Now, there will be proposed sort of or kind of new or added layers um, around things like the AI system needing to be a safety component of the product in question um, and the product requiring conformity assessment by, by a third party, so a notified body. Um, so requirements for high risk AI systems wouldn't you know, automatically trigger just because you have, for example, a toy incorporating an AI system, for instance. But, but that definition of high risk system is an important part of the AI regulation where we see this potential for overlap with products legislation. And I think it also marks the beginnings perhaps of a sort of coming together of the risk-based approach built into other product specific legislation and a new AI regime. Um, although I suppose the proposal talks about integration with existing sectoral safety legislation to, to ensure consistency and avoid duplication. Um, it has been noted how <clears throat> the practicalities of that and how that's actually going to work uh, are going to need to be to be clarified and set out in further detail. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then I suppose just, just to finish off on the risk categories, um, after prohibited systems and the high risk AI systems, we also have the low risk category um, and they'd be encouraged to self-regulate by implementing um, codes of conduct um, and also certain uh, systems in that low risk category would also be subject to transparency obligations. Uh, and that's where there would be a risk of uh, manipulation. So when a person interacts with an AI system um, and, and their or their emotions or characteristics are, are recognized through automated means, or if an AI system is used to generate content that uh, appreciably resembles uh, authentic uh, human created contact, uh, people interacting with, with such a system would need to know that. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Thanks, Jamie. I, I'm just keen to know a little bit more about how the AI regulation is going to impact the existing framework that we have for consumer product regulations. Maybe you could talk a little to that. Yeah, sure. And we'll, we'll take that um, next slide now, please. But, but that's a great question. And um, Although we have the beginnings of the answer when, when we focus in on things like, you know, the definition of a high risk system and the list of legislation in Annex 2, it, it is still hard to get a clear picture of exactly how uh, what's intended as a horizontal piece of legislation is going to map across so many pieces of product legislation, um, many of which themselves are being updated. Um, and in most cases, you know, with, with a view to taking account of all these challenges which are brought about by you know lots of other technological advances apart from just um, the advent of of ai um, so for example we have the proposal for a new uh, general product safety regulation that, that ashling has spoken to we also have a text on the revision of the product liability directive which is expected uh, very shortly we think um, and both of those existing directives have, have stood the test of time relatively well but, but over recent years, they have come under scrutiny because of all of these rapid advances in technology and, and the way that things like online marketplaces, AI, the Internet of Things, um, th these can all be difficult to address uh, using concepts and definitions that were set out uh, decades ago at this stage. So one issue that relates to AI um, are proposals to revise the definition of a product. Uh, given the growing intera interaction that we see between physical products and, and software products. And we see examples of steps to address the, the safety risks brought about by new technologies and how product safety rules should apply to software in the, the proposal for a GPSR that Ashing was speaking about and in, in other pieces of legislation. Then in, in terms of the product liability directive, um, we, we then see other issues that are relevant to AI, like the, the definition of a producer also perhaps needing to be clarified to determine uh, 
you know, who should be the producer in the, in the case of an update, an upgrade, or a modification of a product, for instance. And, and that could become especially um, complex or nuanced when we set that against definitions of operator and, and user in the AI regulation that I mentioned earlier. Um, should we be looking again and revisiting the concept of putting into circulation to take into account of how software, especially AI systems, um, can be updated or changed, or, or in the case of AI, even sort of change themselves um, after they are already on the market? And then should there be a change, um, again, for, for the example, in, in the approach to, to proving a defect, given the so-called uh, black box issue that we get with AI and the challenges that, that consumers uh, would face and, and will face and are facing um, in trying to trace damage caused by an AI system uh, back to the sort of the, the actual defect or malfunction in, in the functioning of that AI system. And so where does that all leave us? Well, we're currently in this state of, of flux um, where a regulatory regime for AI is still taking shape um, while reviews of the General Product Safety Directive and the, the Product Liability Directive are also going on. Um, and that, that obviously that gives rise to an awful lot of uncertainty for stakeholders. Um, so what we really need to see now is, is for all three pieces of legislation to sort of form up and arrive in a way that establishes some sort of coherent framework. Um, and if and when that happens, uh, it could result in a highly sophisticated regime that is truly capable of accommodating all of this technological change going on in the products market. That's the ideal. Um, but the risk is obviously that an overlapping set of sort of multiple liability and, and safety laws for different products uh, and then AI forming part of those products could lead to um, a degree of confusion or, or inefficiencies um, or you know, unintended uh, regulatory gaps or overlaps. Um, I think at the very least, um, even if what we do get is a working set of, of frameworks, it will likely be quite a, a complicated um, regime. Um, and it will take quite a while to, to figure out exactly how everything works together uh, for any given product or product portfolio. And so for example, you would have a specific regime for high risk AI systems, which would then need to be mapped into or onto your sector, se sector specific product safety legislation, and also a new set of product liability rules in order to then um, ensure that, that everything is fully provided for from a, a regulatory and a liability uh, exposure perspective. So understanding exactly how the new product safety and liability frameworks will interact with the AI regulation is going to be crucial. And the regulation or the legislation rather will need to be clear for industry to ensure that there are no um, regulatory gaps and that product manufacturers who use AI in their products are completely clear on, on what their obligations are under what legislative framework. And I think um, even with clear legislation and um, the guidance to accompany that legislation is going to be incredibly important in terms of providing stakeholders uh, with the tools that they're going to need to interpret, you know, what could be or what to a certain extent already are whole new concepts. Um, and, and what is probably going to be quite a fundamentally different type of product regulatory landscape that is designed now to keep pace with, with what has become a very different um, market for for products in Europe than, than what we have had, what we would have had even 10 years ago. Yes, I, I mean, definitely it'd be interesting to see how the interaction between the different pieces of legislation play out down the line. So uh, finally, could you tell us a little bit about the fines and the enforcement uh, me uh, mechanisms in the draft AI regulation? Yeah, um, and if we take the next slide, please, I'll try and zip through this, just remaining conscious of time. Um, okay, so setting aside, um, the other enforcement powers of national authorities, and you, you're into things like you know withdrawal and, and, and recall of AI systems there, but um, the regulation provides for this hierarchy of fines depending on the severity of, of the infringement. The figures there are obviously uh, significant, so it's safe to say that the, the regulation really is designed to have to have teeth and grab the attention of, of stakeholders. Um, at the top end of the scale, you have breaching the prohib prohibition on those unacceptable 
risk AI systems that I mentioned, also infringing data governance uh, provisions for high risk AI systems. And that's around things like the data, the integrity of the data sets that are used to sort of test and train and, and validate those systems. And the next step down, which I suppose is the sort of the main tier, if you will, is still a fine of up to 20 million euro. And similar to what uh, Dermot was mentioning, um, as part of his presentation about these sort of turnover-based fines, they obviously they also appear uh, here in this proposal. Um, and then uh, for, I suppose, the next tier down, we have supplying and correct or incomplete information to notified bodies and competent authorities. And that's still up to, up to 10 million or 2% of total worldwide annual turnover. So, I mean, the compromise text and the, the European Parliament opinion you know, have suggested certain changes to the penalty provisions, but not really in respect of those amounts. So it is worth bearing in mind that those substantial figures appear to be on their way to making it into the final text, uh, for the time being at least. Um, and just finally on suggested amendments, when, when it comes to penalties and fines specifically, you could view those fines as, as being designed to sort of get the attention of, of the very large operators in, in the tech sector, for instance. But both the compromise text and the the European Parliament opinion have highlighted how the penalties do need to be proportionate so as not to hamper uh, economic competitiveness and um, innovation amongst the smaller players. And also the, the European Parliament opinion has taken uh, the, the data governance provisions to do with the integrity of the data sets. And it's proposed that they might be dropped down from the tier one into the, the tier two. Although I will say that the way that breaches of, of those requirements are currently still punishable or possibly still punishable with that, that highest tier of fines. I think it is something that speaks to the emphasis that's being placed in this regulation on ensuring the integrity of, of those data sets that, as I said, are used to, to train, validate and test these models, especially in the case when it comes to high risk systems. Yeah, um, thanks, Jamie. I think that was all very insightful. I'm just mindful that we should be wrapping up. And with that, I'll hand this session back to Wendy. And unmute. Uh, Sahari, Jamie, thank you very much for that. I mean, certainly the interaction of the uh, regimes, all of which are undergoing change on product safety, product liability, and the AI regulation certainly makes that a a tricky area. I suspect that's not the last we've heard from it. And you're probably already setting the agenda for the third annual MHC Consumer Products Conference. But in any event, let's try and go quickly to uh, a couple of questions. There are about eight or 10 questions we have in the um, Q&A box. Uh, so we'll try and keep our answers to a minute or so, so that we get through all of these and any more that do come in. Juan, could I ask you, Oh, everybody there on the screen. Great. Could I ask you a question there that um, how does the CPC network deal with the issue of jurisdiction and in particular the country of origin principle? How does that cooperation under that regulation, does it take account of? And are we, are we talking about consumer protection laws being very much on a country of origin principle? Uh, um, thank you, Andy. Uh, yes, I mean, first and foremost, I suppose, um, and, and especially in, in you know in a digital environment, we need to bear in mind the provisions of you know Article Three of the E-Commerce Directive, the, the the principle of you know the country of origin principle. But uh, that very article provides for a derogation in certain cases where the measures are necessary for the protection of uh, consumers. So. We have learned, I suppose, um, from experience and dealing with colleagues, you know, from uh, dealing with uh, competent authorities in other member states, that they may take action in, you know, in, in in those member states, even if the trader is based in another jurisdiction. So, in the context of uh, CPC, the CPC regulation itself, uh, even in the context of um, coordinated action, uh, would require the competent authorities concerned to take all necessary actions in those member states. So it, it doesn't put it on, on the shoulders of the competent authority in the country where the, where the trader is based. So on the other hand, the, 
the the CPC regulation, and I'm, I'm just trying to remember the, the language that is used in the in the regulation. Um, I suppose um, you know just to rationalize, I suppose the you know the those enforcement measures that that should be done in a coordinated manner. I mean, it's a coordinated action. Uh, I suppose it says simultaneously, but uh, I mean, that, that's something that. Um, that should be taken into account. And the omnibus directive also contains a provision in the indicative uh, criteria for the, in, you know, when, when establishing the, you know, the indicative uh, criteria for the imposition of penalties. The, um, so, I mean, all in all, it is possible for a competent authority to take action against a trader um, that might be based in, a, in, other, in other jurisdiction. Um, Again, um, yeah. you, know, you know, not not notify the members, etc. I'm just thinking that <clears throat> most of you know a significant uh, amount of activities in the CPC network would concern compliance and, and engaging with traders in terms of fostering compliance, etc. And that's something that you can do at cross border level without worrying too much, I suppose, of uh, you know if the trader is based here or the competent authority is based there. So when it comes to actually take enforcement action. That's where you know difficulties may arise, and, and that you know that's something that may also be challenged by the traders themselves. So it's something to be aware of, yeah. but it's not necessarily a barrier. So it, there are technical avenues for for overcoming such difficulties, and, and we've seen that that's the case in practice. So. Okay. Um, Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you, Juan. Um, I mean, I think I suppose we're familiar with how the one-stop shop sort of arrangement works under GDPR, and certainly for consumer protection, uh, what we see in practice is that it's not quite as clear-cut or rigid as that. So, if a trader who's based in Ireland does, uh, and there are a lot of the big uh, tech and online companies who are based in Ireland, uh, uh, face uh, complaints or investigations in other EU member states that is something they're going to have to deal with. And okay, it may then come through the CPC cooperation sort of systems uh, that will involve the Irish authorities, but it's not a case of, oh, well, we're not established in France, so we don't have to talk to the French uh, consumer protection regulator. That seems to, yeah, to be the way. Okay, we will very briefly, just as you mentioned this, um, uh, something that is in another question that came in, about cross-border fines work under the Omnibus Directive. Will the CCPC be able to impose a fine based on turnover across the affected member states or will the fine be limited to the turnover in Ireland? I suppose the first thing we should clarify is that it, in Ireland it is the courts that will be um, actually deciding on fines. So that's unlike GDPR. It is the CCPC that will be involved in the coordinated action under Article 21. And the fines, the turnover-based fines, are only for those offences which come within that coordination um, procedure under Article 21, so that have a cross-border element. But all of that said, I suppose the answer to this, and Juan, you correct me if I'm wrong, the, uh, that in the uh, Omnibus Directive, the fines are to be, can be based on the turnover of the trader in the member state or states concerned. So exactly. taking yeah, account of the turnover in the other member states, but then also, I think you mentioned, Juan, in your answer, that the criteria is that the court in Ireland should take account of any fine that's already been imposed in another member state arising from that same offence. So I think that, yeah, answers that question. Exactly. That's uh, impeccable. <laughs> it's, um, I mean, if we're in a coordinated action and, and it is decided that it would be down to the coordinator of the action to bring proceedings against the trader in, say, in, in that jurisdiction. Um, in principle, the, the penalty to be sought, obviously the determination would be for the courts, but the, the, the penalty to be sought would take into account the annual turnover in all the member states concerned. So, the, you know, the, the, the coordinator in this case would have um, should have the power to actually do so, you know, to say, oh, I can only bring proceedings in respect of the harm in, in, in my country. No, no. In, in, the the universe makes it clear that it should be taken into account the, um, the turnover in all the member states concerned. And if, um, if another authority has taken action in the respective jurisdiction and, you know, imposed fines, etc., that, that should also be um, taken into account. 
in, in the final determination. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you for answering that. Uh, Jamie, one here for you that I'm not sure am I asking you to get your crystal ball out, but effectively, when is it likely the draft AI regulation would become law, both at EU level and then in effective in member states? Um, yeah, that is that is tricky. I think, I suppose, one thing you can say is that although the text is the, it's still up for grabs, there's still a lot of you know amendments and proposed changes to it. You do see, you know, a, a, a good degree of momentum. You could say uh, built up through things like the compromise text and the the European Parliament opinion. So it would seem well on its way to adoption. I know if you hear about you know the second half of 2022 or the end of 2022. I don't know if that's actually going to happen. We just don't know. Um, however, I, I think beyond that, um, one thing we we do see in the, the draft is this relatively speaking quite fast 24 month implementation period. Um, so possibly, you know, if, if we had an adoption before the end of this year and the 24 month transition period were to stay in we could be looking at a regulation that's you know possibly you know well full or partial full effect um before the end of 2024 um and that would make it all the more important as i mentioned to have very clear guidance in place for stakeholders to turn to so um it's difficult to tell at the moment but potentially we're on quite a, a quick uh, path to real legislation that has a real impact, you know? Okay, okay. Um, I'm trying to answer this question here, which came in. The question is long enough, but effectively um, about the obligation of providing an update for connected goods. So while the seller has an obligation to provide such updates, according to the directive, the consumer may choose not to install the updates. It's clear how this is implemented in such devices as smartphones, where they're provided for installation. Would you interpret this freedom of choice as a requirement to get consumers' consent to push updates? In case connected goods without a UI, uh, can the seller request a one-off consent or otherwise inform the consumer to then push the updates? What risks do you see here? Would you see this consent being explicit or sufficient included in the T's and C's? Okay, it's quite a lot in that. The uh, I think what's clear from both the Digital Content Directive, or sorry, the Goods Directive and the Draft Consumer Rights Bill is that the legislation envisages a two-step process that informing the consumer about updates is one thing and supplying the updates is another. And that recital 30 of the um, goods directive says that the consumer shall remain free to choose whether to install the update. Now, I think you could probably, the trader could probably look for consent from the consumer at the outset for something like not a smartphone, but uh, connected goods consent at the outset to provide updates sort of auto, well, automatically, but in for the possible to inform the consumer at the time. I don't think a sort of GDPR level consent of uh, all this sort of transparency and specific detail is needed. I wouldn't just put it in the T's and C's. I think I would get at least a once off um, a clear consent from the consumer. And I think the consumer would have to be able to revoke that consent um, later if it wanted. But subject to those two, I think you could then uh, inform consumer and, and push the update out. Um, so I know whether that gives enough of an answer, that uh, long question. Um, we had a question here again about market trends. Uh, I think, Juan, this is probably to you. Are the market trends that you referred to in the presentation, I think this probably comes back to the biennial report that was published there last month, uh, or this month by the uh, Commission, are they an indicator of the CPC's enforcement priorities? Well, you know, as indicators go, uh, market trends may be helpful, but, uh, but a market trend is not necessarily an enforcement priority. And what I mean by that is that if, you know, a market, tre a market trend may show practices that give rise to concern, but that doesn't mean that, that an enforcement action will follow. I mean, what I mean is that, uh, I mean, if you take into account the level of, you know, the harm or the nature or the gravity, the scale of, of the, the duration of, of, the, of the practice, and, and just, you know, 
the kind of kind of their um, suppose prioritization principles like uh, you know the strategic significance of or significance of the action or, or the risks associated or the cost associated with the action. I mean, the, the trend might be there, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that is that harmful. And and you might choose, um, you know, how to best use your resources. Basically, if you know, even you know, if, if something is trending, that doesn't mean that that is um, damaging consumers. And so, I mean, in other words, it is a good indicator. Uh, it's certainly an area to be watched. Like um, you know, that, that's in terms of monitoring compliance, for instance, that would certainly be an area of focus. But it doesn't necessarily translate into enforcement action. So. Okay. Okay. Good. And the thank you for giving us the link to that uh, document. That is uh, interesting to see both the trends that, uh, in terms of online practices and unfair commercial terms, but also that report has other details like the extent of uh, online purchases that are made by consumers in each member state. And Ireland is pretty high up there in terms of I think about eighty-five to ninety percent of. Uh, Irish consumers have bought goods or services online in the last year. Uh, sorry, it must have been 2020, as compared to an EU average of about 74%. So we're certainly pretty tech savvy. Um, there's a question here about the Digital Services Act. Um, how does the Digital Services Act that we've been hearing about um, in the news recently relate to or affect the laws that Dermot and Wendy were talking about? Dermot, is that something you want to apply to? You want to take that? Sure, um, I can start with if you want to jump in. I mean, yeah, they're pretty different. I know they've got similar titles, but they're pretty different. Um, they're dealing with very different issues. Um, I, I suppose the first thing is the Digital Services Act is a regulation, so it is going to be directly effective as opposed to what we were talking about, uh, which are directives. I think it's primarily aimed at the sort of large... Um, uh, search providers, the large intermediaries primarily. So there's a sort of scale of, of um, parties that it applies to. Um, so I think it is slightly distinctive from what we were talking about, which is sort of purely consumer focused. I mean, it, uh, Wendy, would you agree with that? Yeah, well, I think uh, not surprising that question came in because it is incredibly confusing that there is this new digital services directive which came in first January and the EU at the same time is talking about a proposed Digital Services Act, very similar title, but as you say, it does slightly different things. The Digital Services Act is the EU's sort of drive to create a sort of more transparent and safe online environment uh, and to, I suppose, tackle some of the uh, market practices by um, the, not just uh, online intermediaries, but particularly the very large uh, operators. And actually the Digital Services Act goes hand in hand with the Digital Markets Act. The Digital Markets Act moves like to the head and that kind of deals with competition and accessibility and uh, interoperability of services. So yeah, confusing that they have a similar name, do something slightly different. And the Digital Services Act or the Digital Services or Content Directive we were speaking about uh, is law as in it's already passed. The Digital Services Act is at the sort of final political uh, debate at EU level. Um, and that's why it was in the news. There were press releases about it uh, on late on Friday night and Saturday because it was the trilogue, the various the EU Parliament the Commission and the member states still debating. And so some of the big issues towards the end were things like uh, pro prohibiting the use of dark patterns um, in online activity, uh, telling consumers why particular ads or content being recommended for them. So that there's some similar things and then, and they're the uh, big issues. Okay, um, I don't want to run over. Is there any other question there that anybody would like to, uh, my speakers can see in the Q&A. Um, otherwise, I think we should wrap up. We've uh, already stretched into people's um, evening time enough. Uh, all that remains for me to do is to thank all of you for attending. Thank you for your participation. Thank you for the questions you've sent. Um, there will be a feedback form um, circulated to you. It'd be really helpful uh, if you could fill that in and let us know in particular 
suggestions for further topics for this Consumer Products Conference. And then finally, I would like to thank our speakers, in particular, Juan Boiso from the CCPC, who's given us a really uh, insightful and informative uh, outline of the EU's enforcement and cooperation mechanisms, and we're very appreciative for that. And thank you also to my colleagues, um, Jamie, Sadi, Ashling, Dermot, uh, and to our events team uh, for helping this event run smoothly. Apart from Dermot's uh, temporary absence, um, which had me scrambling for Dermot's notes. But we have Zoom for that window. Our next conference may be in person, and the only way we'll be able to uh, have similar effect with Dermot is to pull the chair from under him. Um, when he's up in the conference room. But otherwise, uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, have a very good evening uh, and uh, good luck. <laughs>